Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. I I want to begin by talking a little bit about the two people who will be speaking after me. And I know you have your bios and you're going to hear about them. But one of the things that happens in conventions like this is that it's a wonderful way to uh, learn a great deal about a topic. But, but I hope that for many of us, we take it as the beginning of learning and not the end of that, of learning. And everyone who's, who has spoke to you this weekend and who will speak to you has learned from other people and has learned not just by, by listening, but also by spending significant time reading their books and articles and contemplating them. And I, I want to take this time to acknowledge my intellectual debt to the two men who are speaking after me. We know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, said, whoever does not thank people does not thank God. Gratitude is one of the most important characteristics of a Muslim. And we all, you know, intellectual gratitude and intellectual indebtedness is a great debt to have. It's, it's one of the good debts. Most debts are bad. But we should, you know, continue to expand our learning, not just by listening, um, because it's, it's a little bit easy come, easy go. But please go back and do some more learning. I just want to, you know, highlight some things about these people. Dr. Omar, I first encountered his work when I was a student at the University of Chicago. And even then, his legacy as an interpreter of the Islamic legal tradition loomed large. I was later blessed to be involved with the Nelwi Foundation, which was established to allow more people to benefit from Dr. Omar's, scholar, Dr. Omar's scholarship when he returned from Chicago after a lengthy period of teaching abroad. Dr. Almud has taught us a great deal about the importance of authentic culture as a vehicle for religious values, about the necessity of digging deeply into the history of minority and Western Muslim cult communities like the Chinese Muslims, the Andalusians, and early American Muslims to know our roots, to be grateful to our ancestors who struggled and sacrificed in the face of enormous obstacles and to see how they survived or failed based on their abilities to distinguish the important from the trivial and always to be open to witnessing God's grace and mercy in unfamiliar and sometimes frighteningly different surroundings. As for Dr. Saul, as a Canadian living in the United States in the 1990s, always looking for uh, uh, a way to tune in to CBC Radio. Now with, with uh, streaming radio, it's not difficult, but it wasn't available then. And I would always visit bookstores when I would come back to Canada. I remember picking up and reading his book, The Unconscious Civilization, and feeling such a sense of relief that there were intellectuals who were still digging into the facade of this uh, uh, freedom, presenting um, unbridled capitalism as freedom. His later book on equilibrium has had a major impact on my conviction that balance is one of the most important principles in managing and integrating the various tools and sources of Islamic ethics for practical application. And this is something that is very relevant to this panel tonight as we talk about the purposes or the goals of the Sharia, which are multiple and need to be held in balance. Not last and certainly not least, but enough for tonight at least, uh, is a mention of A Fair Country, uh, a recent book of his that is a marvelous look at the obscured and denied, but never, nevertheless authentic Aboriginal foundation of the Canadian ethos. And uh, I think there are a lot of lessons there for the Muslim community, including for the American Muslim community as we try to remember and understand both the denied and often covered up foundation of, the, of American Islam, which is African American, 
And beyond that, the American Aboriginal ethos that underlies some of the best of the notions of community in the United States. So really it is, uh, I want you to pay attention to the fact that um, the, what you will hear tonight is just a small bit of an enormous legacy, intellectual legacy, that both of these men have produced and God willing will continue to produce. And I hope that you continue to try to learn from them by uh, reading their books and discussing them with others in your community. Now, my theme in, in the short time I have tonight is simply this, that it is absolutely important for a Muslim to adopt multiple frames of analysis or multiple perspectives simultaneously on any issue that we face that is a human issue, a, an issue of human concern. There is never one model, one frame of analysis that can, in some scientific manner, organize all our concerns and allow us to solve them neatly. And what do I mean by this? Well, even if we look at the human condition from a scientific model, which those who do not have a uh, religious worldview might say is, is the only real perspective on the human reality. So even if we took a scientific perspective, what does science say about what it means to be human? Well, does that not depend on what kind of scientist you will ask? An endocrinologist, a geneticist, a neurologist, each one of them can map out and analyze a complex physical system, their function and their dysfunctions, so that any even small injury or illness in that one system can lead to the total destruction of a human being. You can die from a dysfunction in one of these bodily symptoms systems, yet none of these systems alone or even together come close to constituting a whole functioning body. And then if we add the social sciences, sociology, psychology, anthropology, we see more of the complexity, not just of the human body, but of the human experience. And still it's not enough to show us what it means to be human. We can add poetry and art and literature, but still, do we have the whole picture? So when we look at something like the goals of the Sharia, this is simply one of the frames by which Muslim jurists try to organize and manage different understanding how to apply our principles to different aspects of human life. More than anything, how do we pay attention to those things that are important? You know that, for example, we have, according to uh, our scholars, five or six purposes of the sacred law. Protection of religion, life, property, intellect, family, and then some add honor, which I would rather translate as dignity, human dignity. Now, you could say as a Muslim, well, you don't need to look through all of those perspectives. You could just look at them through the perspective of religion. After all, are these not all religious concerns? So why separate out life and property and intellect and family? The, the reason we do that is so that we can pay attention to those concerns. Because if we only say, well, everything is important under religion, it's very easy to overlook or give undue priority to certain issues or certain aspects of what it means to be human and neglect another aspect. For example, I'll give you a, a, a very practical example that, that I know of. And, you know, it confused me a great deal when I worked with Afghan refugees to encounter, uh, you know, religious Afghan scholars, or at least religious leaders, preachers and others, 
who continually justified incredibly harsh restrictions on women, banning them from education, banning them from work. And the reasoning was that uh, sometimes it was too dangerous for women to be in the street. There's political insecurity, so they needed to protect their life Right? They needed to protect their life by keeping them in the house. This would protect their life. They would not be harmed in the street. And banning them from education, well, because it's not necessary for the salvation of, of women to, be, to have a higher education, and the risk of... Uh, of them neglecting family duties by being educated, then they should be banned from education, higher education. Of course, this is a small group in terms of population of those in Afghanistan who believe this way, but they were powerful and they re used religious language to justify this. But this is the nature of extremism. What is the problem with the logic here? Extremism is, is really a problem in, in reasoning very often. It's logical extremism where you take one principle or one factor and you take it to its logical extreme and neglect all other principles and priorities and interests. So for example, we could say, yes, we want to preserve life, but what about the preservation of intellect? when many of these women who were confined to their homes ended up having major clinical depression because of being confined for so long? What about the preservation of human dignity, the ability of a human being to express their um, value in public life, to use the gifts, the intellectual gifts they had, the gifts for service, the gifts to give to the community? What about the need to preserve religion itself? Because when religion is used as a tool of control, then people will turn against religion. So this is a simple demonstration of how the goals of the Sharia, the, the goals of the sacred law can be used to try to bring back some balance as communities are determining how they're going to uh, order themselves and what kind of policies they're going to determine. Now, well, these six, five or six goals of the Sharia are an excellent mechanism for helping us further our discussions a rational basis for us to organize a conversation about our policies and practices and institutions, we need to understand that Muslims today, like Muslims in earlier times, need to assess the reality of our situation, the urgent needs that we face, and continue to develop additional models or frames of bringing balance to our community. For example, one of the things that we don't see as a particular focus of attention by being identified as a goal of the Sharia is the need for privacy. Now we could say that the need per, for privacy is something that we could subsume under the need for honor or dignity. But remember, everything could be subsumed under the goal of preserving religion. The purpose, is, uh, the purpose of identifying a separate goal is to give it attention. So in our time, what is a desperate crying need? Certainly as um, Mohammed Hashem Kamali, Professor Kamali, who has written a number of books on this subject, has identified there is a pressing need for the protection of privacy, individual privacy from the intrusion of the state in our time. The ability of the state to intervene, and, and Chris Hedges mentioned this earlier tonight, to, to monitor and surveil people in this time is so extraordinary and of a nature far beyond anything in human history before that this is a new pressing urgent need. 
And so as we talk about whether it's public policies in a, in a Muslim majority country or in the society in which we live, we need to very seriously take this as, a, as one of the goals of the Sharia that we need to identify and filter. And then another uh, focus of attention, which we could identify in our time as a goal of the Sharia, again, we could subsume it under something else, um, but is the, to give special attention to our experience as living creatures in a world teeming with life from worms and minnows and crayfish to pigeons and sparrows, geese and robins, squirrels and deer, cats and chickens, donkeys and bears, dogs and ducks. What does it mean for me to be a human from the perspective of my relationship to the cat sitting on my lap or the chicken sitting on my plate and then in my stomach? What, what does that mean? Now, we could subsume this under the preservation of life as one of the goals of the Sharia, but again, do we need to give it special attention because of the urgency of the matter, the fact that in our time there is a real, very imminent risk of the majority of species on the earth disappearing. I would say that it requires a new special urgency. Now I want to draw your attention to something. When I mention these different creatures and animals, except for I noticed I had a little bit of a kind of fishing bait theme running at the beginning with worms and minnows and crayfish. But other than that, when I mentioned the animals, I didn't categorize them in a way that you might find typical. I didn't say cats and dogs or ducks and geese. And I did that deliberately because I want to point out and draw your attention to the fact that our lives, our world, our human experience, my human experience, your human experience, is not an Aristotelian diorama where we're all organized in these neat categories that we encounter going from one room at, to the other. But we live in a web of complex, continually changing, decidedly unorganized relationships. And the only way to deal with this, the only good way to deal with this is to be flexible, nimble, to have a good humor, a great sense of adventure, and to constantly shift our perspective. From how, how does this look from the perspective of me as a human? What does this look from the perspective of my relationship with animals? What does this look from the perspective of me as an intelligent thinking person? as an individual. So we keep shifting. This may seem complicated, it may seem difficult, it may seem unorganized, but I want to suggest to you that this is in fact the, one of the messages that the Quran gives us by the medium through which it gives us its messages. What do I mean by that? And we're in Toronto, the city of the great Marshall McLuhan, who said the medium is the message. Think about the Qur'an and how the Qur'an is organized. Some people, you know, non-Muslims who first read the Qur'an find it disorganized. Why is that? Because the Qur'an is constantly shifting perspective. There's the grammatical shift of pronouns. Even God speaks sometimes from the perspective of Anna. And then God is being described, Hua. So we have this, it's called iltifat, it's a grammatical or rhetorical device of shifting. Stylistically, the Quran shifts from a straightforward narrative to a doxology, to an evocative, almost poetic description of nature, to a legislative passage from one to the other. Narratively, the Quran draws us into a description of different figures people and even animals as it describes a scenario. For example, the beautiful passage in Surat al-Naml, the chapter of the ant, which describes at the beginning the marshalling of the Prophet Suleiman, the Prophet Solomon, his troops, giving the impression of an impressive and awesome military presence. Then suddenly we're pulled into a completely different perspective. And the Quran says, at length, when Solomon's army came to a valley of ants, one of them cried, this is the ant, 
Hey, ants, get into your houses, or else Solomon and his armies might crush you and not even notice you. This is, an, this is extraordinary, because here, here we are in the middle of war. War is about the relationship of humans to others. This political demonstration of power, human to human, and suddenly, boom, we're pulled down to the tiny perspective of an ant. How does this look to an ant? Hey, don't forget us. We're here too. We are in God's world just like you are. <clears throat> so shifting perspective is, is the medium of the Quran. It's one of the messages of the Quran. It's something that is confusing only if you feel that you need to do everything yourself. You know, it would be confusing as an individual. But this is one of the reasons why we live in community. We have in our community, we have scholars. We have those who are going to sit for many hours reading books, but we also have poets. We also have activists. We have young people with their energy and their vigor. We have older people. We have those who don't get along that well with people, but they get along great with animals and they can tell you a lot about the natural world from their experience. So part of the perspective then that we need to examine things by is from this perspective of a true shura. Shura meaning not just some kind of democratic political mechanism for making decisions at this high level, but just for our lives, our general decision making. Who, who needs to give input? And of course we can have experts and a scholar who is interactive with people will bring in that experience, but people also need to speak for themselves. Now, we have a bit of a challenge with animals because of course the prophet Solomon understood the language of the animals, could understand the animals according to the Quran. So how will we listen to them? And how will we understand what they're saying to us through science, through study, but also through imagination, imaginative scenarios. What would the world look like to them? All of these things are useful and we need the impact or input of everyone for that. The, but one of the things that helps us with the goals of the Sharia is that these are goals are aspects of human life that are quite universally understandable. And this is why we're able to make a comparison between them and the Ten Commandments. Um, because even as our, our scholars said, that someone who, a society does not necessarily need revelation to identify these as goals. Imam al-Ghazali said, these things are known intuitively, and intuition is really just a kind of experience. That it's known intuitively that any society needs to protect these goals, to preserve these goals, if they're going to survive. And this is why when we talk about the goals of the Sharia, there is an understanding. But again, what does it mean to understand to preserve family if we don't have experience with families. You know, okay, I'm talking about family and you're talking about family, but if we don't know the stories of families, if we don't know the family that, you know, is down the street and they're having to make a decision between dental care for their children and elderly care for their parents, how are we going to make policy decisions about the distribution of property, because the distribution of property, taxation, um, how we will determine how the wealth is spread and how we understand what we have in common and apart is intimately, will affect intimately the kind of families that we want. We need to understand that there's going to be conflicts and sometimes there's not a good answer except to take a completely different perspective. You own a store, a little shop somewhere, 
and a teenager comes in and steals something, shoplifts something from your store. At this point, do we bring down the law and say, this is about protection of property. You stole, you're going to be punished. Or is this the time when we bring in the perspective of mercy and say, what made you do that? Who are you? We may find out that this teenager is homeless, has run away from an abusive home. And so again, we need to bring in all of these different perspectives and frames in order to get a grasp. And this is something that a well-trained scholar in a society that is functioning, where they can interact with people and have input and care about that, will be able to bring in. And that, without it, we will be impoverished because we will not be able to understand things from all of these different perspectives. So finally, um, what are some of the, the, the ways that we can balance or integrate uh, these goals? It is impossible to do this simply as an academic exercise. There need to be institutions through which we further these goals as well as talk about these goals. So for example, a, a family can only be preserved and protected and encouraged through formation, which means good examples, through education, by good nutrition, and what does that mean? Does that mean that the family is responsible for all of these aspects themselves? We know that that's not the case. And it's why I think this community is a very generous and compassionate community and tends to support public policies that really do protect and encourage family. But it's very easy to get distracted by words without digging into the meaning of what it is. Yes, we believe in family, we believe in honoring parents, we believe in the preservation and protection of property. But what, how can we organize ourselves in order to do it? Before me, you had a number of public servants, politicians who came and, and thanked you on, about, uh, for what you're doing. These, you know, it's not just voting for them, but it's really understanding the impact of the policies that they are advocating for and putting in place when they're in office, how they affect all of the community. And my final, the final point that I want to say is that for the Muslim community, you know, very often you hear many of us say we need to break out, you know, of our parochial kind of perspective, looking at things from our perspective. I think we want to be inclusive, but sometimes, again, if we don't have the framework for doing that, we can overlook people or we can overlook things. And so I want to suggest at the end of it that another layer that we put on in our decision-making process or in our analysis, in addition to something, in addition to the goals of the Sharia, would be to an analysis that I would call circles of community. And what I mean by that is that each one of us is in multiple circles of community. On each of these, according to each of these goals of the sacred law. For example, family. We have our nuclear family. We have our extended family. We have beyond that other relatives. And then we can go to sort of the, the looser, ethnic group which is family-like or from the same heritage. Now as we, to be committed and responsible to our nuclear family does not mean that we don't care about other families or that we don't care about the extended family. It means that there's an intensity of commitment at that smaller circle of belonging than there is beyond that. And as we go beyond the smaller circle, then our responsibilities and commitments become more collective. So there's one circle. Then we have the circle of our religious community. 
And this is something that's very clear in the Quran. The Quran does not describe two religious communities, believer and unbeliever. The Quran shows very clearly that the Muslim community, this is our, you know, our Muslim ummah, our Muslim brothers and sisters are our nuclear family. They're our tight circle. Beyond that is the broader circle of believers, of people who believe in God and the last day. Again and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran talks about those who believe in God in the last day, primarily Ahlul Kitab, the scripturalists, but more inclusive than that. But does our circle end with that? It does not end with that because the very dignity that is imprinted on us by being created by the divine, which is karama, nobility and dignity, is something that is for all human beings. Who are human beings? Banu Adam. This is the Quranic description of humanity. What does it mean? Children of Adam. You can't get rid of your family. You may not like them. You may sometimes be annoyed with them, but whatever, they're still our family. So this is another circle. So let me suggest then that we can continue to do this with all of the, the human interests and draw circles where being part of a very intense relationship with other people, religiously or familiarly or, or, or politically, nationally, ethnically, never means that you need to exclude others. It just means that your world can continue to expand and we should never forget that we belong to these broader circles and that we can continue to, to expand them a little more and a little more to bring more people in as we do not neglect our very close and tight and intimate obligations. Uh, thank you for your attention. Assalamu alaikum.